Do you remember your first introduction to the world of Pokemon? Maybe it was picking out your very first starter. Or the release of the first movie in 1998. Or maybe it was picking up a used copy of gold and sprinkling water on that weird looking tree and having it pummel you into the dirt with your 12 HP Quilava. Yeah, I'm still mad. Back then, these moments all felt so real, but in reality, they looked like this. So today, I'm taking your favourite Pokemon moments and recreating them, true to all of our nostalgic memories. First up... Now, if you've only ever seen the 4Kids release of the first Pokemon movie, you might not be aware of just how tragic Mewtwo's backstory actually is. Created by a scientist desperately trying to bring his daughter back to life, and all made possible through the funding of Team Rocket's maniacal mastermind Giovanni. While I was waiting for your suggestions to come rolling in, I knew that this was going to be the first scene that I tackled. Like always, I started off with some simple composition sketches to figure out what direction to take this one in. Even a simple change in camera angle here can totally change the vibe of the story that you're telling. On thumbnail number 3, I knew I was onto something here with the big glass containers in the foreground to stick either some clones or maybe fossil Pokemon into, depending on if I wanted to lean more into the movie's story or the games. I ended up doing a bit of both. In the original red, blue, and green, Mewtwo was created deep within the Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar Island, which just so happens to be right next to the Pokemon Lab doing all of that fossil restoration research. So it makes sense to me that the scientists involved with one were probably also working on the other. This theory is pretty well supported in the games too, with Dr. Fuji having his portrait in the hallway of the lab, as well as his name faded from the sign on Faraway Island in Emerald, where you can find Mew. Blaine, the Cinnabar gym leader, also mentions his old friend and how the decrepit old mansion still holds the remnants of his research. Now, I don't think the scientist in the movie ever actually had a name drop, but he's clearly based on the guy, so I think we can draw that line for ourselves. Giovanni here was a struggle to work in. Originally, I was going to have him up top overlooking the work being done down below, maybe obscured a little by the broken glass of Mewtwo's containment tube, but as I went, I realised that was going to be pretty hard to read, so I moved him down a little more centred. His face also gave me more than a little trouble, I'm not going to lie, trying to give him that confident, imposing, and slightly smug look while standing on the same level as the scientist was hard. But we got there in the end, so here's the grand reveal. Of all the games in the Pokemon series, Fire Red and Leaf Green have probably eaten up more of my time than any other. I used to absolutely chain smoke playthroughs of these two, and while there are dozens of iconic memories to choose from, my first Snorlax encounter has got to be one of the strongest. You'll probably recognize this one from the thumbnail of the video, unless future me goes and changes it, I guess. So I'm gonna let you in on a little behind the scenes secret here. This one was made specifically to be the thumbnail, which brings along with it its own set of challenges that the other yet to be revealed paintings didn't have. When I'm making video thumbnails, I photo bash the draft to hell and back. I make a huge mess. I grab 3D models, cool art I find from artists that I adore, absolutely anything goes. Photo bashing, for those unaware, is just taking different images or 3D models and merging them all together to create one final image. The goal while photo bashing isn't to create a pretty picture, and it absolutely is not to claim it as your own work. I mean, if you're using photos that you took, then go for it, but my goal here is just to figure out a composition and idea that tricks you into wanting to click on this video. If I'm gonna spend hours painting and polishing a thumbnail, I need to know it's gonna be worth the time, because I'd rather just go make the next full painting, you know? Once the draft is done, I'll use that as a reference and go recreate the idea for from scratch. Sometimes I'll even trace over the draft to see if it'll actually work when I start the painting for real. You can totally do this with regular paintings too, by the way. Making art, there are no rules, and anyone who tries to tell you otherwise needs to get that stick out of their butt. Just don't go claiming other people's work as your own. Coming up on the end result, you can see the painting now is super different to that original scuffy draft, but all that photo bashing allowed me to test the idea and come up with something that worked and was fun to make.
The comment requests have come rolling in, and the first one up comes from Icy Skies, who's basically become our channel mascot at this point, I'm not gonna lie. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I fought the Kanto Elite 4 and beat Lance, I felt like a champion. Only to find out that Blue beat me to it and I was in for the toughest fight of my life yet. Going into this painting, I knew exactly what I wanted to make, but I wasn't so sure that I could pull it off. I have a bad habit of taking on bigger projects, not realizing just what I've signed myself up for because I didn't really take the time to think it through beforehand. This time, however, I knew it was going to be hard, but I wanted to try it anyway. The plan was to take the iconic red versus blue fight and spin it into a side-on 2D fighter, something like Guilty Gear, Street Fighter, or Super Smash Bros. And of course, as requested, to also take the Pokemon they had from the Adventures manga instead of their in-game teams. Now the back Background and UI elements are pretty straightforward, there's no problems there. The real issue? Drawing Pokemon is hard, man. I've been drawing since 2019, but when I sit down to make art today, I still feel like a total beginner. Typically, the painting time far outweighs the drawing time, but here it was much closer to 50-50 because I had to keep erasing and drawing and erasing again until I got them all looking at least halfway decent. Up in the corners, I added their Marchamp and Poliwell. You know how fighting games sometimes will let you pick an assist character, someone that'll either swap in or activate an effect of some kind? That's the idea there. Those are the Pokemon they've got lined up, ready to jump in and kick some pokey butt. This is probably my favourite of today's paintings, so without further ado... Now, this video couldn't possibly be complete without a diamond and pearl entry, or rather, in this case, Platinum's Distortion World. I first encountered Giratina in Pearl, but its Platinum introduction up the top of Spear Pillar is legendary. There are very few moments in the Pokemon series that get as intense as this. So uh, let's attempt to do it some justice. The thumbnails here you'll probably notice aren't all for the Distortion World. At this point I was still planning out which moments from the series I'd want to cover, so there's some extra hidden thumbnails for other potential ideas in there. I had three little sketches down for the Distortion World here, but sometimes you just get lucky and the first one you like the most. Or you get lazy and power ahead with a bad core concept. You can decide which of the two this one was and let me know below. I always loved how high the stakes felt in Sinnoh, but it wasn't until Platinum release that it felt fully realised. Getting dragged away into this upside down, twisted, alternate dimension, you can really feel, I feel like for the first time, the intense power these legendary Pokemon really hold, and just how awe-inspiring these creatures really are. Pokemon Emerald is similar with its end of the world flooding and droughts, but as much as I adore the Rayquaza cutscene, it ultimately wraps up with a shut up and go to your room sort of tantrum. Here though, Cyrus's long-term plan is way more devious than involved. Crafting the red chain almost takes the lives of the three lake guardians, and story-wise it makes them an integral piece rather than just some side quest. And even worse here, he actually <laughs> succeeds. When you finally escape, sure you won, but it's not a clear-cut heroic victory like we usually get in these games, because he gets what he wanted. From a certain point of view at least, <laughs> he might not quite see it that way. He got his world free from the human spirit, but now he's stuck in a universe where he's the only soul that even exists. The stakes here are higher than in any previous Pokemon game though, that's for sure. So the Distortion World definitely earned its place amongst today's iconic Pokemon moments. Woo! Another day, another video! If you've got suggestions for other Pokemon moments you'd want to see recreated, then hit subscribe and leave a comment below. I'd love to make a sequel if this video does well, any excuse to paint up some more Pokemon art is a good excuse in my books. Those Hoenn map paintings I've been working on have been really good practice for environment art, and it's way more fun than digging around through Google Maps and painting stuff from photos. Anyway, uh, video's over, high res artwork and PSDs are on my Patreon if you want to show support, and otherwise, uh, bye bye!